Well, good morning. <clears throat> We'd like to welcome you to North I Sandy Baptist Church, and we're grateful that you chose to join us here today. Before I get started, we open up the, the book of Romans chapter 8. I just want to take a brief moment and just acknowledge some of the tension that we are facing both as a, both as a country and really as a church. Um, and that is, it's election day coming up here real shortly. And one of the things that we've been hearing is that there are probably between 30 and 40 million Christians that don't vote um, every, every year. Um, some due to conviction, some due to laziness, some due to uh, um, just, yeah, conviction, some just for whatever reason. Um, but one of the things I guess I want to, as, as a pastor, just kind of wrestle through a little bit is, is just understanding that we are in attention. Um, ultimately, it says in Scripture that above all, you must consider yourself citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I'll know you're standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting for, together for the faith, which is the good news. So in other words, we are first and foremost citizens of heaven. And so regardless of what happens on Wednesday... Um, we are going to be in a place where our world, where half of our, half of our nation is going to be going into a mental health crisis, probably. That's one of the things they're predicting, is that uh, depending on, really depending on whoever wins, um, that's probably going to be the case. And so if, if you walk out on Wednesday, Wednesday morning and you find that, uh, or you wake up on Wednesday morning and you find that, you know what, we won, or ooh, we lost, and that could be various people having different, different ideas of what that looks like. But the idea is, is don't forget your citizenship first and foremost to Christ and his kingdom. Um, when you wake up on Wednesday and if you won, don't think that you've won something eternal. Because if you've won something here and you step back and stop acting like a Christian and stop behaving like a follower of Christ and just say, okay, my guy got in or my gal got in, oh, whew. And then you should go back to life as normal. Well, well, that's not what God's called you to do because your primary citizenship is still in heaven and still a part of what we're supposed to be doing there. And I always think it's really, really important for us always to remember that when Jesus Christ was crucified, he was crucified with a conservative on one hand and a liberal on the next. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, the, the Pharisees were as conservative as conservative gets. The Sadducees were very, very liberal. And so somehow we have to figure out how we maintain our citizenship in heaven, understanding that the kingdom of God, it operates in a completely different manner. Like people say, are you, is, is Jesus more right or is he more left as we're going this direction? And most of the time I tell people, no, Jesus is going in the opposite direction. Because to become great, we have to become the least. And there's never a political party I've ever run into that's looking to become the least in order to become great. We'll have to wait till heaven until those nations exist and those are healed. But in the meantime, my encouragement to you is to remember um, that we are citizens of heaven, but we are also citizens here. So we carry a dual citizenship. So my encouragement to you is to wrestle, to don't just dismiss, to don't just say, no, I'm not going to vote, but to, but to wrestle through, to pray through, to figure out what it is and who it is that I'm supposed to vote for, and then go and give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And that's, in this case, and on Tuesday, that's your, that's your vote, if you haven't done it already. And so that's what I got to say on that. Some of you are, uh, anytime pastor starts talking, you know, religion, politics, and, and oh, yeah, you just, just like, ooh, don't, don't mess with it. And for the most part, I, 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 I try to only deal with it when it comes up in Scripture. But on a day like this, I do want to take some time and pray for us. Pray for you guys as you're making your decisions. And then uh, also pray for our nation as we just kind of wrestle through uh, what's coming up. So let me do that right now. Father, we, we come to you today, and Lord, God, I, don't, I didn't write it all down, and the reason I didn't write it all down is, is probably just because I didn't want it to become polished, just because I'm one of the group when it comes to this. I'm, I'm one vote, one citizen, and, uh, and, and Jesus, ultimately, we serve one Lord and one master. And so, Father, I pray for the people in North Isani Baptist Church, Lord, as they, as they um, seek your wisdom, as they seek your guidance, Lord, as they seek your perspective. God, there is only one Savior, and that's the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, 
Father, I just pray for our hearts, Lord, that they will not drift too far in one direction, that, Lord, our hope, our eternal hope, Lord, will ultimately be in you. Because, Lord, we know where this nation is going. We know it's eventually going to spiral down into uh, um, something that, that doesn't, doesn't honor you. It may already be there. And, uh, but, Lord, we also know that, God, you can use your people to influence a nation. God, and it doesn't come, Lord, through the big, massive buildings and kingdoms and programs and things like that. You say that faith is small of a mustard seed. God, when it's watered and grow, can expand and create so much shade for the rest of the world, bring so much comfort and healing and life. Father, I pray that we as your people, God, will grow um, to be the kingdom of God being built, Lord, here in Cambridge, Isani, and the surrounding area. God, do this for your glory. Lord, we also pray for this sermon today. We pray, Lord, for, um, for God, your word. Uh, God, that your Holy Spirit will meet us where we're at right now and teach us, Jesus, uh, what it means to live life in the Spirit. Do this for your glory again, and in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so I know how to grow in a variety of areas. Like, to grow as a theologian um, requires reading and study, and to grow morally demands a, a change in my behaviors. Uh, to grow my financial net worth, I must save or work more. To grow religiously, I can make church attendance a priority. To grow in a skill or a task, I need to practice. To grow my midsection, I just need to keep eating how I'm eating currently. So some growth is natural, right? Like although I needed to ensure that my kids had proper nutrition and all through grew, three grew up physically and developed without a whole lot of effort on my part, we didn't like to have to hook my kids up to like a stretching machine to increase their height. But a more important question, but often an elusive one, is how do we grow spiritually? Now, every mind is a battle between who we know we should be and who we are. Our minds are filled with mixed motives which result in impure actions. And I know what I should do, but so often I fail to do it. And when I do, I do it in my own power, producing more pride than righteousness. The law of God is exposes me and I can't do what God asks and so I stand condemned. Now this is the bad news that contrasts the gospel because see in Christ the law has lost its power over my life. I died with him and now I have been raised to new life in him and those adopted into his family stand before God holy and blameless without a single fault. This is our judicial position. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So after cleansing our souls, the Holy Spirit now can reside in us, live in us. This is a deposit of a future glory available to us in Christ now. Now, unfortunately, many Christians wrongly assume that our new position in Christ will somehow put an end to all of life's struggles. Our flesh, that self-centered part of our lives, has contrary desires to the Holy Spirit inside of us. That old man, at one point, this irresistible force leading us to eternal death, has now been crucified, put on a cross. But it wasn't shot with a gun, or it wasn't shot with an arrow. See, death by cross means the tortured person is as good as dead, but they still flop around for a while in agony until their life is eventually snuffed out. Now, practically, this means that I'm still a mixed bag of good works and impure motives and remain capable of following my flesh into any number of evil actions. So, in other words, I'm your pastor, I'm going to confess... I still sin. In, in, in his epistle, John reminds us in verse 8 of chapter 1, in fact, he says, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and, and are not living in the truth. This battle between who I am in Christ and my flesh 
is very, very real, and it's very, very severe. Some enter the battle with weapons of theology or moral conformity. We fight by gaining as much information about God as possible, and then we use this information to alter our actions. Know much, then do much. Now let's be clear. Truth matters. Knowledge matters. And moral excellence is absolutely a byproduct of the spiritual life. However, truth and moral excellence do not necessarily lead to inward transformation. We are intended to grow in Christ's likeness. God hopes that over time we will share in his son's love, dispositions, and character. He works to make what is true, true of us. Now this happens through the work of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Now, so we're spending the next four weeks, last week was our first week, working through Romans chapter 8. And so this text teaches us what it means to live life in the Spirit. And so let's read our text for today, starting with verse 5 in Romans 8. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sin nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But but you're not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the spirit if you have the spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them uh, do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit are God, are of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves... Instead, you have received a spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we're his children, we are heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. And so the battle for our spiritual growth begins in our minds. Our brains are battlefields. The seeds of an affair begin with thoughts of lust. Seeds of disdain toward a coworker start in our mind. We tear them down, we discredit them, we demean them in our brains before we ever gossip, lash out, or slander them. All of us have lost battles through mental spirals. Remember, you guys can probably relate. For me, it it can start with like an adverse circumstance. We give into our flesh and we yell at our kids. And then we feel remorse immediately. But our mind is already at work. The accuser returns. Why can't you control your emotions better? Why can't you at least be the adult in the room? Your peers are so much better parents than you are. Did you see how happy they and put together they are in their flannel on Instagram? Your kids will either have years of therapy or they're going to end up in prison all because of this moment. You are a failure as a Christian. How we think will determine the trajectory of our spiritual lives. So let me reread Paul's words again. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life 
and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of the sinful nature can never please God. Remember, this statement is made right after reminding us that there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ. Before, we were unable to think beyond our selfish and our sinful desires. The law condemned us as unworthy. In Christ, we now have the Holy Spirit working inside of us. Before, we all lived in defeat. Now, in Christ, the road to victory is open to us. Eternal victory is secured and ours through Christ's death and resurrection. So the degree to which we experience this victory before our death is connected to how we think and set our minds on things that please the Spirit. The crucified flesh is far more powerful when the nails are first applied. But over time, through the Spirit's work, it will grow weaker and weaker and weaker. Our desires will slowly change to actually match those of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual fruit begins to ripen in our lives, and failure occurs for the believer only to the degree we feed and continue to prop up the flesh. It's like we keep it alive like a pet when we should be killing it like a pest. Allowing our sinful nature to control our minds leads to death. Now, this is not solely a text on eternal security. Like, death is still the natural consequence of being controlled and giving in to our flesh. When I allow self-centeredness to fill my thoughts in my marriage, my marriage slowly dies. Instead of getting stronger, my marriage grows weaker. If I work only for a paycheck, ruthlessly climb the corporate ladder, and disparage my coworkers in my mind, my work life will experience small, incremental, sometimes large, death. What should bring joy and honor God instead becomes this black hole I continue to feed in hopes of it returning me life. This is the way of the flesh. This is the path toward death. But the Spirit does the opposite. If we willfully invest in the lives of others, take time to listen to a coworker's problem, and do all we can to help others succeed, we will experience life and peace. With this dual nature active inside of me, I'm always either bringing life or death. Now, these can be micro moments or become trends in our lives leading to ruin. What takes residency in our minds will eventually produce evil actions. If this pattern is all we experience, and we never experience the fruit of the Spirit, we may have an additional problem. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember, those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. So knowing about God and rearranging our lives to morally reflect what we know are essential parts of growth, but if these pursuits exist apart from the Spirit of God inside of us, we remain lost. I'm going to say that one more time. Knowing about God and rearranging our lives to morally reflect what we know are essential parts of growth. But if these pursuits exist apart from the Spirit of God inside of us, we remain lost. We lack the engine necessary to move. Apart from God's Spirit, we remain slaves to sin and death. Everything we do leads to our condemnation and death. We either become criminals or we become Pharisees. God's Spirit inside of us is proof that we have been saved. The deposit of God's power enables us to live a godly life and resist the temptations of our fleshly nature. So growth for the Christian is one part illumination and one part mortification. We live in the bodies that will eventually wear out and die, right? Like I, I went to the eye doctor. That was a sad day. Um, cheaters. 
Cheaters, never had to wear the cheaters. Anyway, God's creativity contained in the soul. We are unique. There has never been anybody like us. Apart from Christ, this part of us withers away and dies, ultimately eternally, along with our bodies. But in Christ, the very presence of God provides an illuminating light. The blood of Christ assures us that this part of us lives forever with him. So after being cleansed, By the blood, God's spirit resides and brings illumination. Romans 8 puts it this way. And Christ lives within you so that even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. 2 Corinthians 4 maintains this container image of our souls. For God, who said, let there be light and darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. So illumination comes into our souls so that we can see God's glory in Christ's face. This light illuminates our dying bodies to then show Christ to other people. And so part of our growth is connected to the Spirit's work in helping us see Jesus. When we read his words, if you've ever opened your Bible, they become living and active. When we examine his life, we feel his love and care anew. When we listen to sermons connected to God's word, we're reminded of his justice and his grace. Now, I've had a few conversations with with Keith, our Building Grounds guy, also our singer up here, about replacing a few of our older, you know, exterior lights with new LED versions around the, around the, the, the church. Now, in our culture, exterior lights are often associated as much with safety and security as they are anything else, right? And this may be partially true for most churches and structures throughout history. However, we don't always consider back in the old days when you lit a church to highlight the building's beauty. A properly lit structure will remain beautiful at night. Have you ever been by an old cathedral or something like that when it's lit up at night? You see the the stained glass is so bright. Well, the Spirit is intended to have a similar effect in our souls. The goal of the Spirit is to illuminate the person of Jesus, the nature of his kingdom, and the future glory that awaits those who seek him. Additionally, the Spirit empowers our obedience forms God's character inside of us, and fills us with Jesus' love for others. This highlights the importance of what we allow our minds to dwell on. We hinder the Spirit's illumination if we never open God's Word. If we live in disobedience, we restrict His power. Let's keep reading the text. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Now this leads to the second part of the Spirit's work. Mortification. This is an old word that means to put something to death. The Spirit's goal is to destroy our sinful nature at the motivational level. Over time, God, through His Spirit, desires to change our want to by sucking the life out of our old sinful flesh. Tim Keller uses the example of of a piston in an engine. And, And as someone with limited discernible man skills, I admit that I may be a little slightly over my skis here. But the power of the piston is it's an ability to move in an up and down motion within the cylinder. Illumination reminds us of who Christ is and what he has done. It sets our sights on the realities of heaven. It points us to where our real life is hidden with Christ and God. But the downstroke 
is an attack against our flesh. It's taking off the old and putting on the new. We lack the power to kill the old man without a constant look at Christ, at what he's done. And we can't see Christ clearly if our minds are constantly desiring to do evil. This motion inside of our soul produces a compression that forms within us the righteousness of Christ. The law no longer condemns us. In Christ, we're no longer obligated to the flesh. We're no longer its slaves. But if we continue to live by its dictates, we will experience death. If we, with the power of the Spirit's help, put to death our sinful natures, we will experience increasing life in Christ. And then Paul and God's Spirit remind us of an important truth. The Spirit's presence in our lives is evidence of a familial relationship. Let me read again from the text. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you have received God's Spirit when he adopted you into his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are God's children, we are his heirs. In fact, together we, with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. There is a beautiful symmetry between our theme last week and this one. If you remember the first week, we were reminded that there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So in this celestial courtroom, we have been declared not guilty because another person has paid the punishment for our crimes. When we receive this verdict by faith, we also discover another reality that we aren't in just a criminal courtroom. We're in an adoption courtroom. And we had a former father who treated us like slaves. We were motivated by fear. We, we have received the Holy Spirit into our souls, reminding us that we are God's children. We are his sons. Men and women alike receive the son's portion of the inheritance. The Spirit invites us into an intimate relationship with the Godhead. Now, my kids are growing up, but I'm still delighted when they tell me they love me. I don't know if that ever goes away. And then I can reaffirm that I love them. I, t I take great pleasure in being a dad. I hope the depth of my relationship with my kids will grow and mature as they become parents and then have their own parents or have their own kids. But, but the first few years of parenting, I don't know if you guys remember it, but those are some of my favorite. In full disclosure, this may be in part because I don't remember the last time I changed a diaper. But during that season, the highlight of my day would be walking in the door, hearing the rush of footsteps. And receiving that big open arm hugs with the words, Daddy. Every culture has that equivalent. Dada, Papa. And in Jewish cultures, it was Abba. And in each case, the connecting point is that each word doesn't require teeth. When he was alive, Jesus hinted at this new reality. He would refer to God as his Father and yours. When you pray, our Father. Spiritual growth is a relationship before it's a journey. And I believe it's both. But envisioning ourselves being commissioned by God to do a task on our own is an inaccurate descriptor of what is intended to happen. The natural impulse of our children, that our children have toward us and their youth, is now given to you by the Holy Spirit. As we grow, we must maintain this innocent dependence upon God and his spirit. God acts like a father. He roots for us. He reminds us of his love. He allows difficulty into our lives to increase our faith and develop our character. So many religious people live in the wrong story. They look at their behaviors and moral perfection without regard to the condition 
of a relationship. Now, listen, an adult child who sends a card on a birthday, has a successful business, and conducts themselves in a way worthy of being called your son and daughter, but never calls? I don't know if you've noticed that, but it brings as much sadness as it does joy. Spiritual growth is not solely an independent pursuit. It's a journey that we take with our Heavenly Father. Our sonship also brings additional motivation. And since we are his children, we are also his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. The Holy Spirit is a deposit of a future inheritance in Christ. What we receive here is a portion of what we will experience there. There, we will receive new bodies designed to contain and fully reflect God's glory. Every, at that point in time, every inclination of our eternal souls will be to do good and glorify God. We will also be held accountable for how we handle the deposit given for us now. There are a few ways that we can monitor our progress in Christ-like growth. And the first is to inspect our fruit. Paul says in Galatians, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in your lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions of their desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. These qualities should ripen in our lives over time. Growing spiritually should result in our inner dispositions and outer conversations being filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Spiritual fruitfulness should also result in action. When Jesus described judgment, he referred to sheep and goats, right? Let me read the text. The king will say to those on his right, come, to, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. These actions, God doesn't say do these things so you can be welcomed in. These actions are not the source of our salvation, but they are a natural byproduct produced because we're saved. A generous God will also make us a generous people. It says in Matthew 6, 19, don't store up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth eat and them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store up your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Our growth happens as we press against and destroy the flesh while allowing the Spirit to encourage our gaze to look upward at who we are in Christ. This text ends with an important reminder. But if we are to share in His glory, we must also share in His suffering. Suffering is a necessary part of sanctification. Now, many preachers and teachers are willing to exclude suffering from discipleship. We don't offer a suffering uh, Sunday school class because none of you would go. At times, the motivation of these other pastors is to line their own pockets. They preach that giving financially will allow the believer to prosper, live healthy lives, and experience relational peace. Other times, preachers have turned the principles into promises. The result of obedience should be smooth sailing. A plus B equals C. And I believe this, then I do this, and it should always result in the blessings of God. But a biblical understanding of suffering is far more nuanced. The truth is, the path of obedience may sometimes bring peaceful circumstances. A giving and generous spirit may pave the way to healthy relationships, financial margins, and favorable circumstances. However, generosity is not a buffer against suffering. Suffering may result from our own choices. Constantly, consistently feeding our sinful nature will kill our relationships and our circumstances. This type of suffering is the consequences of sin and not the suffering of Christ. 
In our A plus B equals C scenario, we often misunderstand C because we want C to be a stress-free and C comfortable life. God wants C to be his character working itself inside of us. Our flesh desires favorable circumstances while the spirit desires eternal glory. The, this path is found through suffering. During our weekly staff meeting, we pray for, for any healing, for any physical ailment that we receive on any card that you drop in. Every week we pray for that. Um, Additionally, we pray that suffering will produce its intended work in every single person that we intercede for, because our character is forged through the trial, not in prosperity. Eventually, we find that when we suffer, the piston begins to fire as our eyes look up to who Christ is, and then we allow the Spirit to press down against that flesh, and we grow. So let's take a moment and work to see how we might apply this text. First, allow the Spirit to do His work in your life. So learn about God. Do good and moral actions. For many, this is the extent of their discipleship. But God hopes for much more. The spiritual life must include the Spirit. The churning up and down in our mind, setting its hope on God, finding our security in Christ and pressing down against the crucified flesh, robbing it of its power. Learning about God is essential and it's necessary, but it must be a spiritual and a relational pursuit. Engaging in good and moral actions is the exhaust of the journey, not the power to get there. Let me say that again. Engaging in good and moral actions is the exhaust of the journey, not the power to get there. So take this sermon home, reread it, pray through it. Its content might be the turning point if it sinks into your souls. And then secondly, stop hiding. There is one surefire method to derail this process. A father will always have difficulty knowing his child if the child constantly hides. The Spirit will have a tough job if we avoid living in the light. I've gone back to 1 John chapter 1 several times in this series. I'm going to do so again. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God but are going on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we've not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. In this room, there are those with secrets, cherished sins, or desires we don't want other people to know about. We may seek to balance the scales by somehow living a super moral and upright life in public, being experts in theology and becoming servants even at the church. But our problem is, is that the piston quit firing years ago. We exchange spiritual growth for an arrangement with God of our own making, and it isn't working. See, living in the light is something much different. When the law no longer condemns me, I don't have to hide from my struggles, and I don't have to hide my struggles from you. The gospel reminds me that every seed of every sin is in me, all of them. Just because your life and your circumstances watered different ones that got watered in me, my temptations may not be yours, but the same Spirit does the same work in every single one of us. And it's hard for us to ascend where we're intended to ascend when we refuse to allow the mortification of the flesh. And so confess your sin and be cleansed of your unrighteousness. Our confession serves as oil to get that piston moving once again. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day and God for what it means to live life in the Spirit. God, I, I'm kind of helpless Because ultimately, I can preach your word, and ultimately, I can apply it myself through your help and with your Spirit's power, but God, I I can't do that for any of my friends in here. And so, Lord, but I can ask, God, that you will do that for us today. 
Convict us, bring your spirit, bring your text alive. Lord, that we may grow spiritual lives for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.